Well, uh, where does the fear and loathing come from, and how might it be addressed? That's going to be the subject of the, the rest of this talk. Um, I'm going to suggest that, there are, uh, that these fears deserve to be taken seriously, and that they are four in number. The fear of inequality, the fear of imperfectibility, the fear of determinism, and the fear of nihilism. I'll explain each one. And I'll argue that all are based on non sequiturs. All come from the fact that these, this approach to human behavior is novel, not that they uh, really logically follow. And I'm going to go a bit farther and say that not only does a uh, biological understanding of the mind not have the dangers that uh, it's been accused of, but in fact there are dangers in going in the opposite direction, in denying human nature. And what this means is that we should study human nature objectively without trying to put a moral thumb on either side of the scale. Well, let me start with a fear of inequality. This comes from a simple mathematical fact that zero equals zero. If we're blank slates, we must be equal. But if the mind has any innate organization, then different races, sexes, or individuals could be biologically different. And that would condone discrimination and oppression. Well, I think as soon as you see the fear stated uh, so clearly, you see the flaw in it. Namely, that fairness does not require a belief in sameness. When Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, he did not mean we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are clones. Uh, rather, uh, the, our commitment to political equality is a recognition of certain human interests that we assume to be universal across the species, uh, as it was written, that people are endowed with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's also a commitment to, uh, as a policy, prohibiting discrimination against individuals based on the statistics of certain groups that they belong to, such as race, ethnicity, or sex. That is the core of fairness and equality of opportunity, and it has nothing to do with the factual question of whether people are, all people are biologically indistinguishable. Also, there's a downside of denying uh, the possibility of individual differences. Uh, many of the uh, most horrific cases of racial and ethnic persecution in the 20th century, in fact, did not come from uh, targeting groups that were thought to be racially inferior. Um, the problem is that if you believe that uh, all people are indistinguishable, there's a temptation to treat the more successful people not as more talented, but rather as more ruthless or avaricious. And many of the atrocities of the 20th century came from persecuting ethnic groups that provided the circumstances that allowed their more talented members to uh, prosper. Examples include the uh, Indians in East Africa and the South Pacific, the Chinese in Malaysia and Indonesia, the Igbos in Nigeria, and the Jews almost everywhere. Now the second fear is the fear of imperfectibility the uh, dashing the age-old dream in the perfectibility of mankind. And it runs more or less as follows. If unpleasant traits are innate, selfishness, violence, prejudice, rape, that would make them unchangeable, so attempts at social reform and human improvement would be a waste of time. Why try to make the world a better place if people are rotten to the core and will just foul it up no matter what you do? Well, this too doesn't follow. Uh, the one reason is that ignoble motives do not automatically lead to ignoble behavior. And that's because the human mind is a complex system with many parts. And some parts can counteract others. So even if we did have innate temptations towards antisocial behavior, uh, we also have a, a moral sense, uh, cognitive abilities that allow us to learn the lessons of history, and executive systems of the frontal lobes that can uh, receive information from these subsystems and use them to control behavior. Um, indeed, the moral progress that we have enjoyed over the past few centuries didn't so much come from erasing or rewriting human nature as exploiting a certain part of it. The philosopher Peter Singer wrote a book called The Expanding Circle uh, based on the idea that uh, universally people have a sense of morality. That's the good news. Uh, unfortunately, the default setting is to apply it only to the members of your own clan or village or tribe but that social progress over the centuries consists of expanding that circle and deploying the sympathy that we 
instinctively feel towards our own family and friends to an ever-expanding uh, circle of uh, people. We've expanded it to include uh, all races, uh, the mentally handicapped, uh, prisoners of war, uh, uh, newborn children, and most recently to all of humanity, as in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All of which could come from taking a knob or a slider and expanding the application of the emotion of sympathy outward, rather than recreating human nature from scratch. And there are also downsides in the belief of imperfectibility, and I'll mention three of them. One of them is totalitarian social engineering. If people are blank slates, well, the temptation is to say, we damn well better control what gets written on those slates. Because if we don't do it, it will happen by uh, accident. And indeed, uh, many of the, um, the uh, most atrocious totalitarian regimes in the 20th century uh, overtly believed in the blank slate. For example, Mao Zedong, probably responsible for 35 million deaths, wrote, it's on a blank page that the most beautiful poems are written. The Khmer Rouge, which massacred a quarter of their countrymen, had a slogan, only the newborn baby is spotless. And uh, much more benignly, but still um, uh, troublesome, uh, is a quote from uh, the city planner and architect Le Corbusier, who said that city planners should begin with a clean tablecloth. We must build places where mankind will be reborn. A philosophy that's uh, sometimes called uh, authoritarian high modernism, the idea that we, could, we should redesign societies using, quote, scientific principles. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, this cityscape over here is a picture of central Paris, uh, or at least what Paris would have looked like if Le Corbusier had been given his clean tablecloth and was able to flatten it and rebuild it according to his scientific principles. Fortunately, he was not granted that wish. Uh, the problem was that um, his theory of human needs, uh, as he described it, was that every human being needs so many cubic feet of air per minute to breathe, so many gallons of water for bathing, so many gallons of water for drinking, so many square feet for sleeping, and that was pretty much it. Uh, and that's what lead, led to his idea that cities should be designed for efficiency at meeting those needs uh, as opposed to the chaotic, uh, noisy, dirty jumble of cities like Paris that offended his sensibilities. Well, we now see uh, where he went wrong, um, that his theory of human nature was basically the, the blank slate. And he omitted uh, many other aspects of human nature, such as the need for intimate social in, uh, interaction in comfortable spaces, uh, the universal desire of humans to be um, in the presence of living things and green space, the effect of natural light on mood, the need for uh, ornament and uh, aesthetic pleasure, uh, human scale that makes people feel safe in dis dis defensible spaces, and so on. And though Le Corbusier was not given a clean tablecloth to flatten Paris and start all over again, uh, one of his students did design Brasilia, which is notorious as uh, one of the world's great uninviting wastelands. And the, the theory of authoritarian high modernism was uh, in part responsible for the urban renewal projects of the late 50s and early 60s, in which vibrant neighborhoods were often uh, obliterated and replaced by uh, high-rises and freeways and windswept plazas. Um, another downside of perfectibility uh, is the uh, lack of appreciation for democracy. Many of the totalitarian regimes of the 20th, 20th century were led by idealistic, charismatic uh, leaders uh, who exerted a claim of moral superiority over their predecessors as a basis for their authority, uh, believed that their totalitarian state was just a temporary measure that uh, would eventually wither, leaving us in a, a state of uh, anarchism in which people would benignly cooperate and live in peace. In contrast, democracy is based on a rather jaundiced theory of human nature, the idea that people are permanently saddled with uh, a limits on their wisdom and foresight. And the mechanisms of checks and balances were explicitly intended as a way of counteracting the natural tendency among leaders towards uh, ambition and self-deception. 
The idea is beautifully captured in the famous aphorism by James Madison. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. And a third downside in the belief of perfectibility, I think, is a distortion of human relationships, especially parenting. Now, here's a quote from a uh, mother that appeared in the Boston Globe on the um, uh, parenting experts. She said, I'm overwhelmed with parenting advice.